Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's really wonderful to see such a strong turnout, uh, a really strong turnout, actually. Um, and I also want to thank the Cornell Southeast Asia program for helping us put this event together. Uh, looking up, I can see it's now the quarter past 12, which means that in Vietnam, it's now April 30th. Today is a holiday in Vietnam, or roughly liberation of the set there. And some people even get the whole week off to celebrate. Elsewhere, of course, April 30th is a rather more somber occasion uh, known as Tan Phu Den or Black April, which I think speaks to the enduring and still contested legacy of the Vietnam War and to the timeliness of today's talk. So I just want to let you know we have a few events prepared for today. Um, in addition to this afternoon's talk, we also have a film screening at the KN Center at 6 p.m. The film is Journey from the Fall, and it's the story of a Vietnamese refugee family. It was funded entirely by donations from the overseas Vietnamese community. Uh, so please feel free to check that out. Um, it's open to the public. We'll be serving refreshments, and that's 6 p.m. at the Cayenne Center, uh, just down the hill on Stewart Avenue. And before I introduce our two speakers, I just wanted to say a few quick words about our uh, Voices on Vietnam lecture series. Um, in part as a result of the massive American commitment during the Vietnam War, academic scholarship on Vietnam has been dominated by American perspectives and experiences from the conflict, uh, often relying heavily and in some cases exclusively on American sources. So as a result of this approach, the vital role played by Vietnamese actors and commenters in shaping and interpreting their own past has long been overlooked. What we're hoping for with this lecture series is to help address this imbalance by drawing on lively debates on Vietnamese politics and recent history occurring within overseas Vietnamese communities, and also increasingly in Vietnam itself, thanks to a rapidly emerging blogging and social media scene. These flourishing Vietnamese language print and online networks represent a vibrant space in which analysis of contemporary Vietnam and its history is produced, dissected, and contested. Our um, Voices on Vietnam lecture series will feature specialists on Vietnam, including current and former politicians, um, journalists, activists, scientists, writers, historians, and leading Vietnam scholars. We're very fortunate today to have two very distinguished scholars here to help us kick things off, Professor Frederick Lobeval and Professor Keith Taylor. Um, Dr. Lobeval is the Stephen and Madeline Anbinder Professor of History, the Vice Provost for International Affairs, and the Director of the Mario Ainaudi Center for International Studies. Professor Taylor has also published a number of seminal articles on Vietnamese history. Uh, so we'll be letting each of our distinguished guests speak, and we'll have time for a few questions at the end. And let's give a warm welcome to our two very distinguished guests. Well, um, the uh, study of the Vietnam War has changed a lot over the years. Um, and some of us were busy studying it even while the war was going on, uh, up close and personal. And uh, in general, the way the war has been fought and remembered in this country is, to a large extent, uh, a reflection of, of American thoughts or recycled French thoughts or uh, North Vietnamese wartime propaganda recycled through the anti-war movement. And they concentrate on the Americans and the North Vietnamese, and if at all, the South Vietnamese, uh, usually in a very derogatory way. Um, people say that the South was handicapped. Americans at the time said it was handicapped because it was not democratic enough. It was a dictatorship. And yet, um, nobody at that time ever thought that being a dictatorship was a handicap for the North. Other people said the South was handicapped because it had too much freedom, couldn't compete with a, a, a foe that was so um, top down and, and had mobilized the population in such a totalitarian way. But in fact, that's what the war was being fought for by the Southerners, for the freedom not to have a society like that. 
I'm uh, going to talk more about the Vietnamese because that's been my main interest. Uh, American and French foreign policy, Fred is expert on that, and uh, he can tell us a lot of very interesting things about from that perspective. I don't know if I can tell you anything interesting, but I will talk, try to uh, bring out some of the things that I've uh, the questions I've asked and some of the answers I've come up with, at least provisionally, uh, that um, have changed the way I thought about the war through the years. And my ideas continue to change as I study more. One question that's often asked has to do with the Geneva Accords in 1954. And the, the question of who violated the Geneva Accords as if uh, this is a, a question that somehow gives us a, an in, in uh, a way a way into the whole issue of what the war, the American war, was about. It is often said that the Americans did not sign the accords. Well, of course, in fact, nobody signed these accords. The the only two accords, the only accord that was signed was the ceasefire accord, and that was signed by mid-level uh, military officers, a French officer in. A, a Viet Minh officer. And there were no other signatures at all. And the whole question of, of uh, the status of these provisions in this document under international law is still controversial among legal experts. So the, the question of uh, why the Geneva Accords, that their significance, I think it is still a very interesting issue. Why was this, these Geneva Accords left so vague? Because they are very vague and contradictory. In, embedded in the Geneva Accords is a deep contradiction. First of all, there are competing agendas at the conference. There are irreconcilable claims between these two Vietnamese governments. There was an implicit Franco-Chinese uh, understanding about uh, how the future of Indochina should, should be. The U.S. opposed any kind of recognition of, of the DRV at all. And the co-veners of the conference, the British and the, the Soviets, they were seeking to calm down the Cold War in Asia so that they could concentrate on European issues. And the details were not really that important. So in, the, in this Geneva Accords, is a contradiction. First of all, declaring uh, Vietnam as a sovereign, united, country with its territorial integrity and at the same time partitioning the country into two parts, two which were controlled by two irreconcilable governments. I think it's safe to say that the non-Vietnamese powers at Geneva saw partition as a solution to prevent a future war. Just as in Germany and in Korea, this idea of elections in two years was simply a kind of fig leaf to cover this contradiction and the hope that a lot can happen in two years. The larger powers did not really take the election provision seriously, I don't believe. Any effort to unify would mean more war, and the point of the whole accord was to remove Indochina as a place of Cold War confrontation. Another question related to this is, why did Pierre Mendes France, the French prime minister who uh, negotiated the Geneva Accords, why did he refuse to, ratify, uh, to ratify the independence treaty that his uh, government had, had made with the state of Vietnam, the, the uh, government in Saigon at that time? They had negotiated an independence treaty in the spring of 54, just before uh, the, uh, just as the Geneva Conference was convening, uh, just before the election among this France. Laos and Cambodia had already gotten their treaties of independence from France, but, but not the state of Vietnam. And I think this is very telling. France uh, never did ratify this treaty of independence with Vietnam. They never did recognize the state of Vietnam as a sovereign state in the same way that it did Cambodia and Laos. And the reason is, is at least one reason, and there may be other reasons, was that Mondays France wanted to retain French authority over the state uh, of Vietnam in terms of its military, diplomatic, and financial affairs to facilitate their normalization with the DRV, which continued the pace thereafter. So then why did Ngo Dinh Diem, the leader in the South, hold this referendum in October of 1955 and declare 
the state of Vietnam to become the Republic of Vietnam. He saw the Geneva Accords as a colonial agreement made by the colonial power over his head in a way that would retain French supervision of his government. So this referendum, I don't think many people have understood it, but uh, it definitely, when you look at it clearly, or at least in the way I do, uh, it is essentially a declaration of independence from France. It's a way to uh, remove Bao Dai out of the picture, who was considered by Gordensium as a, a French duke. These are some things that you don't find in most books, but I just uh, come out of questions I've asked. There are a lot of contradictions among the Americans that uh, uh, appeared in the, in the late 50s in is how to, uh, how to behave and what their policy should be in Vietnam. And uh, the conflict was between what uh, one scholar has called high modernists and low modernists. And the, uh, the low modernists were more or less uh, uh, more ascended during the Eisenhower era. They believed in a more bottom-up type of development that relied on local initiative. Whereas the high modernists that really came into their own under the Kennedy administration had a more top-down American style notion of development programs, big powers right, to address its agenda over the heads of its uh, allies and client states. It's a kind of a, a more imperial attitude. So when North Vietnamese aggression brought this, this the, the whole situation to a head in the early 60s, the high modernists ran out. They, they, won, they won out and, and uh, not only did the kind of low modernist position fall by the wayside, but of course, Ngo Dinh Diem also became uh, expendable and uh, the serious, very serious consequences to American interests and of course to the Vietnamese as well. One question that is always being asked is how did and why did this new war begin? And the fashionable view that is often made is that the flaws in the Republic of Vietnam, the flaws in Ngo Dinh Diem, uh, he was the architect of his own downfall. But this ignores the fact that he did not start the war. It was started by the rulers in Hanoi. And why? Well, a very common explanation about why Hanoi wanted to uh, embark on this, this policy, what they call the Southern question, how to deal with the South. Um, the most common here is, is to unite the country. Somehow they have a right to rule all the Vietnamese. They, they assume that right to expel the American neo-imperialists. Um, but you, when you stop and think, the, the American advisory presence until the Kennedy years uh, in Vietnam was no larger than the Chinese advisory presence in the North. This idea of, of foreign intervention, I think, um, can be looked at with a bit more nuance. And when you actually look more clearly at, at what we can tell, what we know of what was going on in Hanoi, it becomes clear that the policy of war to settle the southern question was controversial, even in Hanoi. And of course, um, the reason why it was affirmed and maintained for so many years had to do with the ascendancy of Le Duan, who became secretary of the Vietnamese Communist Party in the late 50s. And he uh, was utterly devoted and dedicated to this policy, this war policy in the South. And, he, and any resistance to that, if he had allowed it to develop, would threaten his position in the party. And so the again and again, the purges that we see in Hanoi in the 1960s to remove people who did not agree with this, uh, the turning of uh, Ho Chi Minh to a kind of party mascot of Uncle Ho, uh, all of all of this uh, is in, in behind all of this is Lei Zuan's uh, necessity to maintain its position in the party and to enforce this policy. That's one of the flaws, really, of uh, as I mentioned in a moment, of um, Johnson's concept of the war is, is uh, failure to really understand it. Also, I think um, it's it's worth mentioning that uh, this. The Republic of Vietnam in the South had defeated the communists by 1958. 
and that Hanoi committed to a new war in 1959 and 60, uh, and that this was directly related to the rise of Lezwan. There's a lot of questions about the Kennedy administration. Um, they, what happened in the Kennedy administration, there were two different ideas about how to respond to this new war, the, uh, the new war that, that the North was bringing into the South. Wooden Zeeman and the Southern government had one idea about how to do it, and the Americans had another. And they never really resolved this. Uh, they just went their separate ways. And uh, when a crisis uh, appeared, um, the Americans engineered what they thought was, was uh, a solution to the crisis and simply made things much, much worse. Uh, Ngo Dinh Diem and the South Vietnamese government had ideas about how to deal with the insurgency. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to take the time to go into this in much detail, but um, uh, the Americans had other ideas. And um, Ngo Dinh Diem was really very not, he was not at all pleased with the way the Kennedy buildup came on, you know, in just a couple of years there were suddenly from around 600 to 16,000 American military personnel in the country. Uh, he was very dismayed by this. He called these uh, people, uh, uh, the, these soldiers without passports. And um, he was trying to resist the American efforts being made to control uh, the policy of his government. So there was, this was been brewing for quite some time. And it, it came from uh, this idea of linkage, which uh, an American ambassador had come up with, linking American assistance to the South, to the South, uh, South Vietnamese government, changing their domestic policies to include more politicians, being more open. Um, the, of course, the people that the Americans were championing to be involved in the government were largely um, the residue of the French colonial regime. And these are people that Modians and just didn't really want to have anything to do with. The Buddhist crisis, uh, it's a very complex matter, but uh, these young nationalist activist monks were reacting to a number of things in Hue, the city of Hue. Uh, I think well, all I will say is that uh, they certainly represented a minority of all Buddhist monks in the South. Uh, it's well known that the, that the, this movement of resistance among these activist monks was uh, infiltrated by communist agents, uh, which they were infiltrating practically everything in the South. Um, the leader of this movement, uh, Tichu Kuang, was uh, determined and, and made it very clear. He uh, openly stated that his aim was to destroy the Saigon government and raise the issue of religious persecution which is often taken very, generally taken very uh, seriously outside the country, but uh, I think it's a very problematic uh, issue. Um, and knew, knew exactly how to use American media. This idea of the myth of the war being lost uh, came out of uh, a kind of joining of the frustrated American advisors and young activist American reporters who uh, were very active in uh, creating the, the impression of incompetence and uh, failure. This whole Buddhist crisis was calmed down within about three months, but by then the process was already underway in which the Americans were encouraging the South Vietnamese Army to take over the government. Why was this? Well, um, it's a complex thing. Of course, Kennedy has his role to play. He was floating with the media frenzy, and uh, he really didn't pay a whole lot of attention when he might have. Averill Harriman and the high modernists of State Department were basically dictating the policy to overthrow the Ngo, Ngo Dinh Diem and his brother. Um, Averill Harriman really hated Ngo Dinh Diem because Ngo Dinh Diem criticized the Laos agreement that he had come to. Um, Averill Harriman had uh, insisted on negotiating this with Laos in 1962, which essentially, from a South Vietnamese point of view, gave the North Vietnamese access to the borders, to the whole Laotian border in the West. And uh, Rodinzi was very much uh, 
opposed to this and Haramu never really forgave him for, for resisting the, not trusting the Americans on this. Uh, of course, uh, this would be a great handicap uh, for the South throughout the war. And of course, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. and Kennedy picking this man to become the, the uh, ambassador in South Vietnam, went to Vietnam believing he had a mandate to overthrow the government. And he worked hard to achieve that and did. So uh, another question that is often asked, which um, Fred has thought about a lot too, was how and why did Midgen Johnson intervene so massively in 1965? Uh, I'm not going to go into all of that, except to just mention a little bit about how he went about it. Um, the explanations are myriad and controversial, and we can talk a lot about them. But uh, I think it, it's very curious how, the Amer how this country went into this war with no intention of winning. Uh, but rather to persuade the other side to give up. This was a concept of limited war theory that had been developed at that time. So there was no strategy aside from what they call graduated pressure. Just keep increasing pressure on the enemy until they decide to, to give up. And there was no concept of actually doing what you would have to do to win the war. So without a strategy, everything came to logistics, which is no mystery because what what is the American Army best at more than any other army in the world? Logistics, moving lots of men and material vast distances. And so it just became a logistical operation of sending more and more stuff there without a whole lot of thought of what was going to be done with it when it got there. So the Laos and Cambodian sanctuaries continued to be a huge handicap. And so Westmoreland, um, I'm rather sympathetic. What could he do except, I mean, search and destroy became about the only thing he could think of to do under that situation. Um, it wasn't a very good policy, but the whole, his constraints were such uh, that uh, he really didn't have any good options and uh, had to rely on some kind of tactical concept to, to squeeze out something like a strategy. And of course, we all know that uh, Lyndon Johnson really didn't have any common sense about military matters. Um, this was really too bad. There were important people who were dissenting. Um, one, one of my favorite people, figures in the American government at this time is Harold K. Johnson. Uh, he was the uh, um, chief of staff of the army throughout this time. He'd uh, been a man who had uh, been in the Bataan Death March during the Second World War. He'd uh, been through terrible times during the Korean War. He was a real uh, infantryman's um, leader. And he had a, a desire for a strategy, and he had ideas about a strategy, but uh, Johnson just had no patience with anything that the, the Pentagon had to say to him. He believed he knew everything. And um, Harold Johnson, uh, two or three times, depending on different stories, was on the verge of resigning in the midst of all of this because he, he felt that it was uh, terribly destructive of the army, which he loved very much. And uh, each time he stayed on because he felt that at least he could do the, do the best he could to minimize the damage to the army. And uh, on the other hand, if he would resign, then he didn't think anybody else would have the same feelings he had about this. And of course, the other man is Robert McNamara. And uh, we know already that in the fall of 1965, after the Battle of Yadron, this is the first major encounter between uh, American um, forces and North Vietnamese forces um, up near the, the border with uh, Cambodia and the highlands. Uh, he, had, he did his counting. You know, he was a great man on statistics. He loved numbers. He counted them up. He was busy. Uh, you know, uh, analyzing rates, estimated rates of infiltration, uh, body counts, and he came to the conclusion already at that point uh, that um, it wasn't going to work. He was quite clear. Uh, and within a few weeks, he was trying to persuade Johnson to call a halt to the bombing and to try to find somewhere to negotiate a way, a way out. Now, I just want to bring into the whole picture something that. Uh, um, I think is always missing, and this is the South Vietnamese uh, 
in the Second Republic, which was formed in 1967. After the First Republic was uh, abandoned in 1963, there was a period we can call the Interregnum, in which the two groups had overthrew the First Republic. The activists, monks, and the army officers were contending and struggling to control the political process. And in 1966, uh, the army finally won out, suppressed the activist monks. And they, uh, at that time, in that same, uh, just as that was happening in 66, elections were held for a constituent assembly. Um, a group uh, of uh, politicians uh, began to, to write a constitution. In by early 1967, Constitution was ready. Elections were held in uh, late 67, and uh, by the end of 1967, this new so-called Second Republic was in place. Um, I we can't even begin to talk about what all this means. I think it's a very important event. It begins this new republic began to take over the conduct of the war, uh, and. Uh, we think the Vietnam, of Nixon's Vietnamization policy is something that came out of, out of American thought. But in fact, um, Nixon's Vietnamization did not really, was, was it not created by the Americans, but it was made possible by the successes of the Second Republic. Um, Westmoreland's successor, Creighton Abrams, uh, from 1968 on, began a policy of turning the war over to the Vietnamese. And for five years, 69 to 73, uh, the Second Republic had really great and interesting achievements in, in its economy, in agriculture, land reform, judicial independence, legislative politics, um, and military development. It's five years of growing strength and successes. Uh, it's the the uh, Tet Offensive of 1968 had a completely different um, effect in South Vietnam than it did in this country. In this country, the Tet Offensive not only demoralized the Americans and uh, turned the people against the war. Uh, in South Vietnam, it led to a, a great rallying of support behind the Second Republic. Uh, the uh, people were streaming into the, the military to, to defend something that now seemed viable that was working. It wasn't just uh, a bunch of monks and, uh, and army officers uh, um, flailing around, but they actually had a government, they had a judicial system, had a, a legislature, they had elections, uh, they had um, opposition parties. Um, it's certainly not um, perfect the way Americans would think that democracy should be, but it was a start and in the midst of a very uh, desperate war for survival. And in fact, uh, we see the outcome of this 1972 when the North Vietnamese attacked into South Vietnam with virtually everything they had. A major, using all of their reserve divisions, invaded into the South from three directions, uh, two of them through Laos, one directly across the DMZ. And by this time, uh, the American withdrawal or redeployment had gone to such a point there were uh, virtually no American ground troops left in the country. So this was fought by the South Vietnamese and they stopped the Northern invasion, they defeated it and they pushed it back. Of course, the Americans who were there helping them um, with uh, air power and with uh, logistics. And it was this that really moved the whole situation to the Paris Agreement. Uh, because these achievements convinced Hanoi to finally get serious about making a deal with the Americans. They knew now that it wasn't going to be an easy thing to push over the South. And like Geneva, the South was left out of the negotiations. Geneva was a colonial agreement, Paris was a neo-colonial agreement. How was the Paris Agreement reached? It goes, the diplomatic side of this is a very interesting and kind of sad story from the South Vietnamese point of view. Already in 1968, when the Paris talks began, the American uh, decision to agree to four-party talks, in other words, the United States, uh, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and 
the South Vietnamese communists. Already, right there, these four party talks violated so the uh, Republic of Vietnam sovereignty. In 1971, Nixon made the concession that any agreement can uh, be made and allow the North Vietnamese army to remain in the South. So already, this concession was made. It wasn't until 1972, after the fighting of that year, uh, it persuaded Hanoi that uh, they could not get rid of Saigon so easily. They had been manning up at that time that before there could be an agreement, the South Vietnamese government, the Republic of Vietnam, had to be dismantled. Now they gave up that demand. And so there could be a, uh, they could proceed to, to work out an agreement. And Kissinger, who uh, was very eager for an agreement, um, went ahead and came up with, with a draft agreement. Uh, Nixon was less uh, eager for it, and he was taking Saigon more seriously than Kissinger. And uh, so then another question, this is kind of my last question. Why the Christmas bombing in December 1972? It always seems to be a mystery. But there's a very simple explanation for it, which nobody ever seems to see. At least it seems to me. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, it looks very clearly to me um, this was a reaction. Nixon went to the, this uh, bombing of, of uh, North Vietnam at the end of 1972. Uh, after the reaction from Saigon, I mean, after all, I mean, when, the, when this agreement became known and uh, the South Vietnamese were never consulted about it, it basically was, was destroying their, their whole republic. It was destroying their constitution. The National Assembly was uh, um, protested against it, and of course the president, and when the two was uh, very opposed to it. But they knew that they couldn't, they could not uh, change the American determination to 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 come to a conclusion. But they wanted to some changes that they felt could help them. So Nixon tried to make some changes in this agreement. And uh, the North, uh, North Vietnamese are so upset with this that they took away a concession that they had given before. The concession, uh, the North Vietnamese had agreed that the question of American prisoners of war was a separate question from, South Viet from prisoners of war in South Vietnam, from Vietnamese prisoners of war. Now, in uh, early, mid-December of 72, uh, the North took that back. We can't have an agreement uh, to give you back your prisoners of war unless we also have a protocol for releasing all of uh, uh, the Viet our, our Vietnamese prisoners in the South. Well, Nixon knew that, that would, he could not do that um, because the, that would mean that he would never get the prisoners of, American prisoners of war back uh, for the foreseeable future because start straightening out the, the uh, Vietnamese prisoner of war issue would be just utterly complex and, and uh, it didn't have any kind of prospect of a, an easy solution. So holding American POWs uh, hostage to that issue was unacceptable. Furthermore, and, and even more important perhaps in some ways was that in, in November of 72, an anti-war Congress was elected and they were threatening to pull the Americans out of the war by legislative action in, in January when it convened. So there was a, a deadline for Nixon to get out before Congress began to, to get involved. So the, the Christmas bombing was meant and resulted in Hanoi really uh, 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 separating out these issues of the American POWs again. And as on that basis, then that the final agreement was able to be made. But in any case, the sovereignty of the Republic of Vietnam was quite, it was compromised by this agreement. Very similar to what happened to the state of Vietnam with France at Geneva, only this time, there was no powerful ally like the Americans had been in 54. There was no, no such ally standing in the wings to, uh, 
to keep the prospect of a, of a, a Vietnam, a non-communist Vietnam uh, alive for, for the people in the South. So those are just a few of the things that I've been um, thinking of trying to answer these questions in the last few years.